In this segment, I want to talk about how to create a free body diagram. And free body diagrams are a useful way of representing forces. Uh, they're useful because it's an organized way to represent forces, it helps us to visualize the situation, and it's a really nice first step uh, for when we get into more involved, more complicated uh, force problems. And so, you know, we learned about motion diagrams in the first week, and then, you know, we kind of moved past them. They're still a good tool to have, um, but we've learned more sophisticated ways of representing this information with position velocity or position versus time graph, velocity versus time graphs, and acceleration versus time graphs, and then as well as algebraically with the big five equations. So we kind of moved past motion diagrams. Free body diagrams are not like that. Uh, we're going to be using free body diagrams in this chapter, in the next chapter, the one after that. We're going to be using them all semester. And next semester, when we talk about electric forces and magnetic forces, we're going to use them again. And not only that, you know, if you were to go into the basement of the library and you were to go look at where all the scientific journals are, and you were to go get physical review A, for example, like if you're a hotshot physicist and you publish some awesome paper, then that's where you hope it goes, right? I mean, you might get into to nature or science or one of these that's maybe intended for more of a pop audience, but that's the pinnacle if you're publishing physics for other physicists. And guess what? If you look in that physical review, uh, guess what you're going to find? Free body diagrams all over the place, right? So representing forces with free body diagrams is not baby physics. It's the real deal. And it's a great skill to have as we move forward throughout the rest of the semester. So let's dive in and let's figure out how to do that. This is just a way of representing forces, collecting our ideas so that we can move forward with other problem solving steps. First, we're going to identify all of the forces acting on the object. So we practiced this a little bit in an earlier segment. Um, and at this point, hopefully, you're pretty good at identifying what forces are on an object. Draw a coordinate system. This is just a super important step, um, almost whatever kind of problem we're doing. Uh, we use algebraic solutions to most of these problems. And an algebraic solution requires you, most of the time, to impose a coordinate system on the problem. Since a coordinate system is not universal, in other words, there's no cosmically correct x and y, right? It's not, it's, it's not, you know, this is not x and this is not y in some cosmic sense, right? Y, x, right? No, it's, it's something we make up to help us understand the problem, right? So, in other words, your x and y might be different from my x and y. We should agree on the same answer, though. And so, because of that, you just need to tell me and yourself, because you're solving this problem, what coordinate system you're using. And most of the time we'll use a standard x, y, right? And I mentioned in an earlier segment, the time when it's important to not do that is when we have acceleration uh, that goes through two dimensions with a standard coordinate system. If we can constrain our acceleration to one dimension by tipping it or something, then we will. Anyway, that was a long way of saying, draw your dang coordinate system on your paper. It is an important step. We're going to use the particle model. So represent the object as a dot. Now your book says to do that at the origin of the coordinate axes. And if you work through the examples in your book, which I recommend you do, then that's how they draw it there. Personally, I find that it makes it a little more cluttered. And for me personally, I prefer to draw my coordinate axes off to the side. And I will do that um, as we go through. And then we're going to draw vectors representing each of the identified forces. And then will identify and label the net force vector. Now, this is another one of those where sometimes I'm asking you what the net force is, and you won't know the answer until we're done, right? And so don't get hung up on step five too much if, you, if you're not sure about it. That could be because you haven't solved the problem yet, right? So drawing a free body diagram is a great first step. There's times when you won't know what the net force is in this great first step, right? But we should be able to identify the forces acting on the object. Okay, let's just practice. Draw a free body diagram for a book at rest on a horizontal table. Okay. A book at rest in a horizontal table. Well, we're going to use a standard x-y coordinate system. There is no acceleration to constrain to one dimension, so there's nothing to get worked up about that. Um, how should we draw a book? Oh, that's what a book looks like if you're in the particle model. 
and you're drawing a free body die. So. Okay, think to yourself. Of our catalog of forces, what forces are acting on the book at rest on a table? You probably have one near you that you could gaze upon. I have one right over there. Gravity? Totally, got gravity. What direction? Down! Gravity always pulls me on the pulls me bottom line. I'm going to identify it as the weight. What else? Other forces. It's the normal force, right? We also have the normal force, which is preventing the book from plummeting towards the center of the Earth. How should its length compare to the weight? Well, is the book accelerating? No. No acceleration, no net force. The weight and the normal force must balance. And so, we don't need to get out a ruler, but let's make those equal in length. Making a net force of zero. Great. A book at rest on a horizontal table. A book at rest on a tilted table. Let's do that. Here's our tilted table. Here's my book. Do we need to tilt our coordinate system? Hmm. There's no acceleration. So we don't need to tilt our, uh, our coordinate system in order to constrain the acceleration to one dimension. Eh, doesn't really matter. What forces do we have acting on it? Well, certainly still weight. What direction does weight pull? Still straight down. That's all gravity can ever do. I see a lot of times students will draw up weight like this. Ooh, that is incorrect. That is incorrect. Gravity does not care if this book is on a hill or not. Gravity just pulls straight down. That's gravity's whole job in life. Other forces. Well, there's the normal force. Uh, normal means perpendicular, right? Normal in this context does not mean everyday or usual. It means perpendicular. And so we should draw our normal force perpendicular to the surface. We also have friction. And if the book's at rest, it must be static friction. Which way does it point? Uphill or downhill? Remember, static friction always resists slipping. So the book wants to slip downhill. Static friction is preventing it. It is pointing uphill. There we go. We can get rid of our hill now to avoid confusion. Make sure everybody has vector symbols so that they look nice and adorable. And that's a pretty nice free body diagram. I think in this case, we do know what F net is. What is it? Zero. Boom, a book at rest on a tilted table. Let's do a skier sliding down a slope at a constant speed. Let's see if I can't use some of the work I already did for this one. Does the skier still have weight? Does the skier still have a normal force? Is the normal force still perpendicular to the surface? Yeah. That looks pretty good. Ooh, it's no longer static friction. If the skier is sliding, it's now Kinetic friction. Okay, still pointing up the hill. Constant speed, F net still zero. Behold, a skier sliding down a slope at a constant speed. So you can see here that this is this is kind of one of the, the powerful things about this representation, is that it really strips away the unimportant details. So whether it is a book sliding down a, a, a incline or a skier sliding down a slope, the free body diagram looks identical. And even that book at rest versus a skier sliding, the only difference is whether it's static or kinetic friction pointing uphill. Okay, how about this one? A car accelerating from rest on level ground. Well, here's my car. What do we got? We've got weight, certainly. No reason, and we'll just use our standard coordinate system again. No need to tilt it. We'll, we'll, we'll see examples where we want to, but we'll, we'll talk about them when we get there. Still a normal force, right? Okay. 
So this is the car accelerating from rest on level ground. Shoot, we got drag for sure. And you know, if the car is accelerating in that direction, then there's something causing it to accelerate, some force in that direction. It should be greater than the drag, right? Because the net force is not zero. So that's the basic shape. What should we call it though? Uh, some of you might be tempted to call it the force of the engine. Yeah, but the engine's part of the car. Can an object exert a force on itself? No, it can't. I mean, the engine is in that dot, right? And just the same as like, I can't pick myself up, right? I can give myself a wedgie, but I can't pick myself up. Why not? Because nobody, you can't exert a force on yourself. Yeah, I can try. I can pull a muscle, but I can't pick myself up, right? Same way, a car can't exert a force on itself. It's got to exert a force on something else. Right? And so I'm coming back to this idea that I first presented in our first um, segment in chapter four, which is that every force has to have an object and an agent. The object and agent cannot be the same thing because you cannot exert a net force on yourself. What is the force that's causing this to happen? Well, I want you to imagine that instead of doing this on a road, well, it's on the road, let's say, but it's a very, very rainy, snowy, slippery day. In fact, it's, it's freezing rain. In fact, the road is covered in a layer of ice. And this car tries to do this. Can he still accelerate in the same way as he could on a dry road? No, right? In fact, if that ice is slippery enough, he might not be able to accelerate at all. Well, what force is it that goes away when I put ice on the road? It's not the engine. The engine can still do its thing. It didn't run out of gas. So again, it's not the force of the engine here. What force went away when I put ice on the road? It's friction. It really is friction. So this is the force of friction. Static friction or kinetic friction? Well, is he peeling out? Let's assume he is on pavement and he's not peeling out, in which case there's no slipping. If there's no slipping, that is static friction. So it's kind of strange. It is a little bit strange, but it is friction that's pushing the car forward as he accelerates. Now, what's interesting is that if this car suddenly slammed on his brakes, static friction would suddenly point the other direction, right? And so, indeed, fric static friction in the, in the context of propulsion of wheeled vehicles, or even a person walking, can be a little bit tricky. It can be a little bit tricky. Generally speaking, it's friction that pushes the car forward. It's friction that slows the car down. It's even friction that makes you turn a corner if you're turning a corner in your car. Again, imagine trying to turn that same corner on a super icy street. You couldn't do it, right? So we've got static friction pushing forward, drag pulling back, normal and weight balance because it's not accelerating in the Y direction. I have kind of a cool picture. This is from your book. Um, and hopefully this will convince you that indeed it is static friction pushing forward. If you look at this, this is a race car, right? They call these funny cars. Uh, these engines can produce like 10,000 horsepower. And what's interesting is that the limiting factor on these is really not the output of the engine. The engines produce tons of power. The uh, limiting factor really is friction in the back wheels. Uh, you really want to maximize friction and the car that maximizes the friction typically wins. And this is pretty cool. This car is accelerating to the right here. And what force is it that's causing it to accelerate? I'm claiming it is the static friction force. And if you look right here, that would be happening right here. It is this F road on tire is the static friction force pushing forward on the tire. And look at this. this these are very soft rubber tires. Again, you're trying to maximize friction. So these tires are made out of very soft rubber. And you can see these folds. It just looks like this tire has just been rotated like that, doesn't it? It just looks like it's just been wrapped up. Why? Because there's a huge force on the bottom of the tire in that direction. So I think that's a pretty cool picture. You can really see that. It is static friction that is propelling this car forward. And, um, yeah, causing it to accelerate. Kind of crazy to think about.